Senate Majority Leader Schumer and Speaker Johnson's changing positions on hot button wars abroad are causing rifts within their own party as President Biden fights to salvage his foreign policy agenda. Meanwhile, former President Trump suffers legal setbacks as the general election kicks off. Next. This is Washington Week with the Atlantic. Corporate funding provided by Consumer Cellular. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. I'm Laura Barone Lopez, in tonight for Jeffrey Goldberg. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer issued a stinging rebuke of Israeli leader Benjamin Netanyahu this week, calling him an obstacle to peace. Prime Minister Netanyahu has lost his way by allowing his political survival to take the precedence over the best interests of Israel. And House Speaker Mike Johnson insists he's still looking for a way to pass aid to Ukraine, even if it risks angering his far-right members. Notable moves from both party leaders that could have far-reaching implications for U.S. allies and America's standing as a global power. Joining me tonight to discuss this and more, Zolan Kano Youngs, a White House correspondent for The New York Times. Scott McFarlane is a congressional correspondent for CBS News. Todd Zwillick is with 1A of NPR. And Jim Shudo is an anchor and the chief national security analyst at CNN. He's also the author of The Return of Great Powers, Russia, China, and the Next World War. Thank you all for being here tonight. Jim, I want to start with you with uh, Senator Schumer's blunt critique of Prime Minister Netanyahu. He blamed Netanyahu's actions for pushing support for Israel to the lowest that they've been historically. How significant is this shift, and will it actually result in any policy change? First of all, it's hard to imagine the senior Democrat in the Senate did not do this in conjunction with the White House. And Schumer gives uh, the Biden administration a way to communicate in even starker terms its clear upset with the progress of the war in Gaza, the lack of sufficient humanitarian aid, uh, et cetera. This is a very public break, arguably the most public break uh, in decades, at least, between U.S. and Israeli leadership at a critical time when Israel is at war. The irony is that despite even deep divisions in his, the Israeli public and, and, frankly, deep skepticism of uh, Netanyahu, I mean, he, if you held the vote today, he would almost certainly lose. Getting this kind of criticism from the outside, even from Israel's closest ally, to some degree galvanizes his support or gives him a, a little bit of a lease on life because they don't like to hear that sort of criticism from outside the country while mm -hmm. they're at war. Mm -hmm. I mean, Zolan, it's no secret that Biden, President Biden is clearly frustrated with Netanyahu. Uh, Vice President Harris uh, recently met with Netanyahu's top political rival, Benny Gantz. And today, President Biden said this in response to Schumer's speech. I'm not going to elaborate on the speech. He made a good speech, and I think he uh, expressed a serious concern shared not only by him, but by many Americans. Zolan, is, Sch is Schumer essentially saying what Biden won't in public? Well, sometimes I was just about to say what you don't say is just as important as what you do say, and there you don't he see the president condemning Schumer's statements, criticizing it at all. That that does say a lot. Look, uh, the president and the White House, their public statements, they know, uh, have to be, uh, they, they're very sensitive about their public statements because you still have ongoing negotiations when it comes to a hostage release mm -hmm. and a temporary ceasefire. And they don't want to do anything to take away from that. That being said, we do know that as these comments are made, we have seen tensions increasingly raising when it comes to private calls with President Biden and that of Netanyahu. That goes towards Netanyahu not fully backing a potential two-state solution, not doing enough in the White House's view to lower a civilian death toll that's now at 30,000, as well as what we've seen recently with a potential military campaign in Rafah, where we know that many of the displaced 
uh, Palestinians are at this point staying. Um, so tensions are definitely rising, and as these statements are made, it's reflective of an overall tense relationship. I also think you, you can't discount the importance of domestic consumption here. Oh, absolutely. Of course, Israelis don't want to hear it from Americans. Republicans hate the statement. Joe Biden has a massive rift and a big problem on his progressive left. He's been looking all along for ways to show that he's not 100 percent full bore behind Netanyahu, even though practically he has been because of his support for Absolutely. Israel. Mm -hmm. And the importance, I think, much more than sending a message to the Israelis, which they can do through private channels, is domestic political consumption to Democrats and the Democratic base mm -hmm. to say, we hear you, we're not with this guy. Yes, we support Israel, but Netanyahu's not our guy. Yeah. You know that's going to matter in Michigan as right. well. It is. We've it's, seen that with the number of administration officials that have been deployed to Michigan to talk to mm -hmm. uh, pro-Palestine advocates. In a well. number of those key swing states with Arab and Muslim voters as well as young voters. Scott, another U.S. ally uh, that uh, Ukraine has been in urgent need of ammunition, of aid. Speaker Johnson says that he intends to bring a bill to the floor with Ukraine aid. What are the chances that that actually reaches the president's desk anytime soon? The Ukraine aid, that was a job the White House wanted done in 2023. Yeah. Here we are in mid-March, and it's still not done. The Speaker's office has said, uh, he told us today, in fact, that they're going to have to wait till government spending and funding is buttoned up next week before they can move on to foreign aid in Ukraine. So there's another week that's going to burn by before next Friday's deadline. And they're going to have to pass it with Democratic votes, too, which is such a novel thing that mm. the Congress is functioning now, needing the minority to provide all the requisite votes for all the vital things. There are these two discharge petitions that end run they run to circumvent leadership and force something onto the floor. Those are sluggish right now. They're not going to move in the next few days. It's going to take time. And time is burning. And I think for some Americans, no matter what they think, of TikTok, mm -hmm. they got that bill from the floor to passage mm -hmm. in eight days, yeah. and Ukraine money is sitting there month after month. And, and Ukrainian forces are suffering. They, they are running out of ammunition. They're already being outfired, outshelled by Russian forces there. And I've been told by Ukrainian commanders that I keep in touch with who, who are on the ground there that they are losing lives, that this is costing Ukrainian lives to, to have U.S. aid stalled. I think it's so important to remind folks that these, when we report on the daily sort of updates of congressional negotiations, there are lives at stake. I spent time recently with a Ukrainian family that's currently on parole, temporary refugee mm. status, for lack mm -hmm. of a better word. And they said that their relatives in Ukraine are calling them each morning to ask specifically about whether or not the U.S. will pass aid and whether or not they're closer. And it seems we are no closer at this point. I mean, Todd, when the Senate passed Ukraine aid in May of 2022, only 11 Republicans opposed it. Uh, but a vote earlier this year, more than two dozen Republicans opposed it. What's changed? The House Republican Conference is MAGA land. Yeah. The Congress is in this situation, not because of Congress writ large, but because of Republicans. Republicans are in this situation because Donald Trump is against this aid. Mm -hmm. He relied on Viktor Orban, authoritarian leader of Hungary this week, to filter his message to the world that he is not going to spend a penny on Ukraine if he's reelected. And I think it's important to look at this holistically. We don't have time to go down the entire history of Donald Trump's relationship with Russia, but started in 2016, if you like, when he looked into the camera and asked Russia to interfere in the election on his behalf. They did. 2018, he went in front of the world in Helsinki and sided with Vladimir Putin instead of his own intelligence services. Russia interfered in 2020. Uh, Trump uh, campaign officials, in fact, campaign chairman Paul Manafort, gave private polling information to a Ukrainian-Russian agent named Konstantin Kalimnik. That is in the Senate Intelligence Report. Mm -hmm. I, I recount all this to give you the holistic vision of somebody who's running for president who has completely divided his party because he has upended decades yeah. and decades of pro-NATO, pro-Western, mm -hmm. anti-Putin and, and it's not secret. I mean, he's made public statements praising Vladimir Putin as a strong leader. And I spoke to, to several of Trump's former senior advisors for, for the book, and they told, they told me that in a second Trump term, Ukraine aid is done. It's finished. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just one piece of a larger reversal in U.S. Yeah, and policy. I do want to get to the stakes and what mm -hmm. those former officials told you. But first, Jim, in your new book, which is out this mm -hmm. week, which I have right here. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you issue a warning. You mm -hmm. say that we're in this post-Cold War global order and that the U.S. is in a 1939 moment. Why, why do you say that? So uh, I'd been reporting on the deteriorating relationship between the U.S. and Russia for a number of years, written about it, uh, and, and Russia and its uh, our European partners 
But when I was in Ukraine in, in February 2022, when the tanks started rolling across the border and the cruise missiles started falling on Ukrainian cities, it struck me that this was a clean break. Putin had already taken small pieces of Europe before, a piece of Georgia, two pieces of Ukraine in 2014. But he was attempting to absorb the largest country in Europe by force of arms. Uh, and he had been telegraphing this for some time. Uh, it didn't happen as quickly as he wanted, but he's still at it and has killed tens of thousands of people, including many civilians in that process. Process. And that, to me, and I traveled around the world for this book from Western Europe to Eastern Europe to Asia uh, and to others that I spoke with, is a challenge not just to the U.S., but to the system we and our allies and much of the world has relied on for 80 years since World War II, a general respect for the sovereignty of borders, open trade lanes, etc. Uh, he's challenging that. And, and there's a parallel to 1939 and that we had a leader like that in 1939, went by the name of Adolf Hitler, who attempted the same thing. And you had many of the same, you, you, you had appeasers at the time as well who said, well, if you give them a little piece, it'll be fine. Uh, but I think Churchill's quote about an appeaser is someone who feeds a crocodile and hopes that he will be its last meal applies here. Uh, and uh, when I ask world leaders that, that same question, is this a 1939 moment, they put it in similar terms. Mm. And the domestic political calendar isn't just November, though. I mean, we're in the heart now of congressional primary season, mm -hmm. where your only threat in some of these Republican districts is a threat to your right, somebody mm -hmm. to outflank you on the Trump side. Mm -hmm. These are the people the speaker will have to go to to try to get votes for Ukraine aid right now. I think the, the, this gets more perilous the further we get into 2024 because of those primaries. And you think that it could very well go beyond the election? It, Ukraine, that, that it may not pass before then. The Congress is going to become more paralyzed as mm -hmm. the year moves on, as if it wasn't paralyzed enough already. <laughs> right. And I think the, the calendar works against this in every possible way. There, and, there was some hope as well in the White House, maybe around November, December, when the trade-off, when it was looking like it would be Ukraine aid, mm -hmm. as well as money for the South China Sea, as mm -hmm. well as for Israel, for border restrictions. I talked to White House officials who were a little optimistic, just... Maybe this month I've been asking those same questions and I get no articulation of a clear path forward for Ukraine. I mean, how are they feeling inside the White House about the prospect? Not good. Mm -hmm. Not good at this point. They did move forward and thought that they actually proposed uh, immigration restrictions that I know that Trump administration officials were telling me during, when President Trump mm -hmm. was in office that... They wanted, they were calling for, raising credible fear, making it harder for asylum seekers. They thought that they gave Republicans uh, an olive branch with that. But when politics, you know, took over with that deal, uh, they, they're not feeling good about the prospects we for Ukraine. We should be Ed. clear on Capitol Hill, too. It is 100 percent true that Speaker Johnson is searching for the votes. He's going to have to use a lot of Democrats. It's usually a death knell for a speaker on a high-profile vote. But it's more than that. Donald Trump's viceroys on Capitol Hill, Marjorie Taylor Greene, are directly threatening him, she said, it might have been 10 days ago, if this aid passes in any form, discharge petition, funny procedures that get around the speaker, any form, Mike Johnson, we will do to you what we did to Kevin McCarthy. That means you're done. That's the threat. And so it's not just used to be with old speakers passing big bills with lots of the other party was really, really dangerous. It didn't make you a good, uh, a good general. Now it's, it's that times 10. Now it's if this passes, you join the ranks of other uh, Republican speakers who've been out. Especially asked. if it passes with Democratic votes, which he said it, he may very well have to try it with that. But, Jim, you also spoke to multiple former Trump mm -hmm. officials for your book, including retired Marine General mm -hmm. John Kelly, who was also former chief of staff yeah. to then-President Trump. And um, Kelly told you that a second... Trump, a second term with him, speaking about Trump, particularly when he would not be worrying about re-election, it would be fundamentally a catastrophe yeah. for us. What are the stakes of a second Trump term? Think of this. He, he's, he served 40 years as a Marine general. He's a gold star father. This is a serious man who loves his country. And by the way, you know, largely a lifelong Republican, saying Trump is unfit for office, fundamentally a catastrophe. That's a remarkable appraisal to hear from a former chief of staff to, to a former U.S. president. John Bolton told me, uh, and, and again, I'm quoting from him directly here, that Trump doesn't have enough of a brain, his words, to articulate a China policy. Uh, you couple that with Vice President, former Vice President Pence saying today he cannot in good conscience endorse him. These are people who worked with him, 
for four years, advised him at the highest levels, were in the room with him as he was making consequential decisions about this country, and they judged that decision-making and his priorities to be fundamentally problematic for this country. It's remarkable. It, 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 and I, I don't think there's any precedent for that. So when, you know, th those appraisals are not coming from journalists. They're not coming from folks on the left or the Democratic Party or rhinos or whatever. They're coming from folks who served in the Trump administration. And, and we, should, we should take pause. We should take pause. John Kelly, by the way, also described to me multiple instances where Trump expressed praise for, for Adolf Hitler, uh, which is uh, just a remarkable thing to be discussing in the 21st century. Right, praised Adolf Hitler, praised a number of other dictators. Putin, Kim, Xi Jinping, you name mm -hmm. it. I do want to get to the number of developments that we saw this week across the Trump's criminal uh, cases. And so, first, Scott, in the case against Trump for his handling of the classified documents, uh, Judge Eileen Cannon denied his motion to have the case dismissed on the grounds uh, that the Espionage Act was too vague. Uh, but this case isn't headed for trial anytime soon, is it? It's four different cases, four different sets of allegations. One thing is consistent. The clock is ticking in all of them, and they don't seem to be getting anywhere. Mm -hmm. So the time is being stretched, which is the M.O. of a Trump legal team, and it has been for years. In the Eileen Cannon, Fort Pierce, Florida, classified documents case, the readout from the room was, this all could have been an email. We didn't have to have a hearing mm -hmm. about this. These arguments were profoundly flawed. We didn't have to go through the process of scheduling and staging a hearing. This could have been expedited. And in all these cases, you could hear could hear the voices, if you listen close enough, of Trump opponents saying, we can move this all more swiftly, but they really can't. I mean, the legal system is made to be judicious. It is made to be deliberate. And because these cases were all unveiled so close to the election, the prosecutors left themselves vulnerable to this, to the clock ticking toward November. In the case of the, the classified documents, though, I mean, isn't it true? Some legal experts have told me that, you know, Judge Cannon could have just dismissed this motion almost immediately. I mean. You've never seen a docket as clogged as that case in Florida. Mm -hmm. The number of entries, the number of filings, it is Herculean and it's just getting started. Well, the issue was the Espionage Act, right? And, 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 and even she, who at other times, and I'm sure we've talked to, to lawyers with similar opinions on this case, someone who's cut a lot of breaks for, for Trump, could not make the leap to say that in effect the Espionage Act, which has been the law of this land for, for many decades, does not apply here. Uh, now, she's left open the window for that to be a, a case to be argued uh, or an issue to be argued later in the case, but even she could not say, hey, you know what, forget about that. The one thing, though, that prosecutors are trying to hang over Judge Cannon's head here as she takes a lot of time to rule on a lot of motions and schedule hearings sometimes when she doesn't have to is the 11th Circuit. The special counsel has already made clear in filings, um, you might want to reverse this decision over here where you missed the law or this decision over here because we've got the 11th Circuit where we can appeal to. She's already been reversed by the 11th Circuit mm -hmm. twice, very early in this case, back when the search on Mar-a-Lago and the search warrants happened. Far be it for me to say that that was embarrassing, but if you ask a judge about the ruling that came from the 11th Circuit reversing her summarily on both of those decisions, it's not something that a district court judge wants to happen again. It was and unequivocal. It was yeah. emphatic. It was, it was a bench slap, as they call it, in legal circles. Uh -huh. That's what it was. It was hardcore, and the special counsel has made clear, we will go back to the 11th Circuit judge um, if, you, if you don't get with the law, especially on a couple of motions that have been out there. So. The other thing uh, that happened was an Atlanta judge rejected Trump's mo motion today uh, to disqualify District Attorney Fonnie Willis. That's in the Georgia case um, that has been brought against him for his attempts to overturn Georgia's election, presidential election in 2020. And so, Todd, what's the big takeaway here from that development? Well, Fonnie Willis can continue on the case. That was the question. Um, most of the experts that I talked to all along never thought that there was sufficient evidence to disqualify her based on her relationship with another prosecutor on the case, Nathan Wade, that it wasn't enough of a conflict of interest that would have disqualified her. That doesn't mean it was good judgment. That doesn't mean it was a good look. And that doesn't mean that there hasn't been political damage here. So Nathan Wade, who's uh, the other prosecutor in question, has stepped aside now. That means that Fannie Willis and the Fulton County DA's office writ large can stay on the case. But if the goal here from the defendants who brought this motion to disqualify her was, sure, get her disqualified if you can, but also get her in front of the public, mm -hmm. get her out in front of pr uh, potential jurors in Fulton uh, County, mm -hmm. dirty her up, drag her through the mud. 
make questionable, um, questionable pictures of her behavior and her judgment, well, the damage is done. That's a good thing. Now, this trial may not take place for months. It probably won't. It may or may not even take place before the election. This mm -hmm. is a sprawling indictment. It's a conspiracy RICO case. There are still 14 defendants plus Trump. Yeah. It's massive. Um, but if the goal here, delay number one, number two, dirty up the prosecutors and anyone who opposes us, they probably you No, know, it's also the case with the most tactile piece of evidence, arguably, of Trump's attempts to overturn the election, a recorded phone call of Trump to state election officials saying, find the votes, find me to overturn the, votes. the election. And for weeks, there's been almost no discussion of that piece of evidence as it relates to this case. Uh, it's been about a, a, a relationship and how it affects the, the prosecution, and that, that in, in itself is, is a loss, right, in, in the court of public opinion. And important to say here, the judge also in this decision did say there was no, uh, they did not find evidence of a conflict of interest as well. But to your point, in terms of having a distraction hang over this case, um, that's, that's going to matter here, you know, especially if, if, you're, if you're the Trump campaign. Something to point to, um, to basically continue the rhetoric around the fact that this is a quote-unquote witch hunt against you, right, which we he... know he's trying to. He is using these, these courtrooms almost mm -hmm. as a way to galvanize his base. Uh, for his campaign. Scott, I mean, how do you see what we saw this week, whether uh, Fonnie Willis being able to carry on as the prosec in prosecuting the case in Georgia, uh, the classified documents development, as well as now this delay in the New York hush money case, does that also impact... Uh, the federal Jack Smith special counsel case into the January 6th insurrection. Sure, freeze up the schedule if they want to put that thing back on the calendar. I, I still argue that case is just different. That's the one that resonates most with Americans because that's the case they kind of watched on live television. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They watched the efforts to overturn the 2020 election. They watched the attack on the U.S. Capitol. And there's something cathartic for Americans and the victims among Capitol Police and congressional staff to just see a trial. Put the outcome aside. Mm -hmm. To see a trial for what everybody watched on TV is just a little bit different than the other three cases. I think it's the one with which Americans are most viscerally connected. All this is now in the hands of the Supreme Court. April 25th, they'll decide. They'll hear oral arguments. They'll hear. We don't know when they'll, they'll decide. When will they decide is the question. They've given themselves yeah. a lot of time. And the real estate is shrinking. I mean, if they, if they take a month or two to come up with that ruling, the judge in the case, Judge Tanya Chutkin, has pledged she's going to give the parties a few more months to get ready for trial because her clock has been halted. All of this gets right into September and October, and you have to ask yourself, is it really tenable to have that trial literally days before potentially breaching Election Day? But what's striking is that we may very well reach November, and, I mean, will any of these cases have gone to trial? It, it looks like... I say looks like. Don't predict that any of these trials will have gone off on time. It still looks like the hush money election interference Stormy Daniels case right. in Manhattan likely will go forward before the trial. So today we got a delay because new documents came in from the Southern District of New York uh, into right into this trial at a very late stage. People are still trying to figure out where these documents were a year ago, <clears throat> two years ago when the prosecutors in Manhattan first asked for them. But at any rate, they're here. Now everybody needs time to read them. You can't just drop evidence mm -hmm. into a case and go to trial. So a 30-day delay from the trial date a 30 day, pardon me, 30 day delay from today, which is 20 days from the t trial date. Mm -hmm. That's the delay. Um, that puts us into April. Mm -hmm. Judge Merchant will evaluate it then. Um, but they were getting pretty close to going to trial, and he has been intent on not allowing too much delay. He swatted away a lot of Trump lawyer attempts to dismiss, delay, sideline this trial. I think there's still a good chance that that trial, which is about a lot more than a hush, uh, hush money payment to an adult film star, that case is about election interference. Mm. It's about a candidate right. hiding, disparaging information about himself through illegal means to hide that information from the American public. That's what the case is about. I think there's still a good chance Two elections go. ago, by the way. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> 2016. Jim, in the, in the time that we have left, I mean, the political ramifications of this, some voters have said they wouldn't vote for Trump yeah. if he is convicted. That's if we see a conviction. What do you see as the ramifications? Listen, I, I think you're right that the New York trial is, is most likely to happen prior to the election, but also the one most easily portrayed as, as a New York blue state DA, right, on, on, on a less central and more distant 
alleged crime than the, the, the worst one. I mean, let's mm -hmm. be frank, the worst alleged one, which is attempting to overturn an election and all the events of January 6. Uh, listen, there's a lot of blame to go around here as to why we haven't gotten to that point earlier, including the attorney general's decisions, when to appoint the special counsel, how quickly they moved, et cetera. Uh, but that's, those are the cards we're dealt with. Uh, the American people will have a lot of the evidence, at least, before them, before they vote, and it's going to be up to them to make a decision. Fundamentally, that's the most likely outcome, that the decision will come in the ballot box as opposed to in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we'll have to leave it there for now, uh, unfortunately. But thanks to all of our panelists for joining us and sharing your reporting. For more on the former president's controversial legal strategies, be sure to check out theatlantic.com. And on PBS News Weekend tomorrow, after a string of fatal crashes, a look at the safety and reliability of helicopters. I'm Laura Barone Lopez. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week with The Atlantic is provided by... Consumer Cellular, this is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular, you get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewan for the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.